what I want to show you is how the symmetry of motion lead, and Noether's theorem leads to antimatter. But in order to do that, I have to teach you relativity. Have you had the lecture on relativity yet? Okay, well, I'm going to give you it again, but in a much different form. And I'm going to do it in all of maybe five or ten minutes. And then maybe you'll have a deeper insight into it. Relativity was not born with Einstein. Galileo realized that it is the symmetry of motion at a different level, the level of classical physics, that defines modern physics. And, and it's built into this law of principle of inertia of Newton's first law. So what did Galileo say? This is effectively what he said. He said, let's say we have two observers, two people, and they're going to make their own coordinate systems. And they're going to measure position in that direction with the coordinate axis x, and they're going to measure time with a clock. So let's suppose there's another observer who's moving along relative to the stationary observer at some velocity along the x-axis. So this, this, if, if there's an object that he says is fixed at some value of x, I'm carrying a coordinate system with me, okay? and I'm going this way, and I'm seeing my value of x prime for that object. So here it is. My value is, is becoming negative. It's changing. So my value of the coordinate of this thing, here's my, my coordinate value, as I move, is changing. Whereas as he sits there, it's fixed. And so what's happening is my value is his value minus my velocity times time. If I'm sitting at rest, my x prime, x coordinate for that thing, is fixed. x prime just equals x. But if I start moving, it starts changing. So I see a tree outside the railroad car window. For the person who's not on the train, the tree is sitting still. For me, the tree appears to be moving. That's all that says. But the core idea of classical physics was that we will carry clocks. He'll have his watch. I'll have my watch. And we'll be able to set them to measure seconds. And we can agree to start them at t equals 0 and let them tick. And no matter how I move, I can look at my clock and I can say, hey, what time is it? And he'll say, oh, it's 1205.75. Yep, it was 1205.75. Time is universal. The moving clock and the stationary clock have exactly the same time, whereas motion uh, of position changes. That's the symmetry transformation law between x and t and x prime and t prime. Remember we did that up here for the sphere? We said got a set of coordinates for one observer, and then we rotate the observer. By rotating them, we get a new set of coordinates, x prime, y prime, z prime, but we're still living on the sphere. So that and that give the same value for a sphere. They both, have, they both live in the radius one of the sphere. Okay? The transformation law is some messy relationship between x, y, z, w, x prime, y prime, z prime, and w. Well, this is the relationship of x prime and t prime for x and t in physics, according to Galileo. This is called classical physics. Now, Einstein was faced with something else. He began to think about time. And one of the things that, that uh, this predicts is that if he shoots a photon, a particle of light, at the velocity c in that direction, if I start running after that photon with my velocity v, I should see it moving slower. I should see it moving with the velocity c minus v. If I run at the velocity of light, I should have caught up with the photon, high photon, running along with me. And if I go faster than the speed of light, I should see the photon moving behind me. That's a direct prediction of this rule. Now, to make the long story short, an experiment was done in around the 1880s that showed that that doesn't happen. If he launches a photon at speed c, and I run after it, no matter how fast I run, I always see it escaping at speed c. It's almost like I'm in the twilight zone. No matter how fast I go, I can never catch the photon. It's always moving at the speed of light. So faced with that, Einstein had a problem. Basically, if I have a flash bulb go off at position x 
equals zero, T equals zero, photons will travel out. And photons are the special ones for which the speed of light times, so here's a future event, let's say, at which a photon is received. In order for a photon to re be received here, the speed of light times the distance x, times the distance times t, must equal x. In other words, c times t minus x equals 0. But the photons will also go in the opposite direction. So there'll be photons at minus x. So ct plus x equals 0. And if I just multiply these two things together, I get ct squared minus x squared equals 0. That's the equation of motion of all photons. If I'm an observer in a new system running after photons, I'll use my new coordinates, x prime and t prime. And if I want to insist that light moves exactly the same way relative to me at the speed of light, then it must be true for me that c squared t prime squared minus x prime squared also equals zero. In other words, all I told you is the equation of motion of light is this. For me, but there's nothing special about me sitting still. For a moving observer, you better get the same equation of motion for light. This is the important thing that doesn't change. For Galileo, this was the thing that didn't change. For Einstein, this is what doesn't change. So this is sort of like a sphere. It's like SO2. It's like x squared plus y squared equals 1. And we know that cosines and sines relate x and y to x prime and y prime, such that x prime squared plus y prime squared equals 1. So Einstein is faced with the question, what transformation law connects this to this? And by the way, you don't even have to talk about photons. You can talk about a distance between events in space-time called tau. That's any c squared t squared minus x squared. And the symmetry of space-time is that this funny new type of distance in space-time should be the same for all observers. So once you say that's the symmetry principle, the rest is algebra. And now it's easy, you can do it yourself with a little effort, to find a transformation law that gives t prime and x prime in terms of t and x for, any, for, for some thing we'll call v. We don't know what v is yet. But what Einstein found is that if you substitute this x prime, where gamma is this 1 over root 1 minus v squared over c squared, and this t prime into this equation, you'll get back this equation. OK? Take these, this t prime, this x prime, substitute this formula for t prime here, formula for x here, do the algebra, and you'll get this. Therefore, the relationship between observers that preserves the, the way that light is seen to move that it's always the same velocity, is this symmetry statement, not this one. And this transformation law is now replaced by this one. But notice, suppose, suppose this thing we call v is small compared to the speed of light. If v over c is small, this thing gamma, this messy 1 over root 1 minus v squared over c squared becomes 1. And this becomes t minus 0 t prime equals t when the velocity is small. What happens to x? Well, gamma becomes 1, and I get just Galileo. So these contain, for small velocity, Galileo's law. It's only when the velocity starts to approach the speed of light, the relative velocity of motion of two observers, that funny things are going to start to happen. Do you understand? This is exactly like saying I have the symmetry of a sphere and finding the relationship between an x prime and a y prime, and an x and a y, and showing that x squared plus y squared equals x prime squared plus y prime squared equals 1. The concept of distance in space-time involves a minus sign.